Uh, good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Ian Whitaker. I'm the Director of Strategic Content at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Uh, welcome to this evening's program, Latin America's Populist Revival. Um, before I introduce our panelists, please note today's event is on the record. Uh, it's being live streamed. Um, we always welcome your social media engagement, but please silence your phones before we begin. Uh, the Council is an independent and nonpartisan platform, and views expressed by individuals we host are their own and do not represent institutional positions or views of the Council. Uh, thank you to our members in attendance today. Your support is critical to our work. If you're not a member, uh, please consider joining. Uh, we have a wide range of, of membership levels to choose from, and you can talk to one of our young professional ambassadors who's at the table at the back there. Uh, they can tell you all about membership. Um, returning to this evening's program, the conversation will be followed by audience questions. We'll take questions from inside the room. Uh, you can also submit your questions online. Just open your browser and type chi.cnf.io. Uh, the address should be rotating on the slides. Um, now, by way of brief introduction, uh, our speakers this evening are uh, Ambassador Roberta Jacobson. She was the uh, U.S. Ambassador to Mexico from June 2016 to May 2018. She actually wrote an op-ed in the New York Times uh, on October 20th. You should check that out, all about her experiences. Um, she also previously served as the as Acting Assistant Secretary and Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs at the State Department. Uh, and Roberta is currently a resident fellow at the University of Chicago's Institute of Politics. Um, Peter Schechter, at the, uh, the far end there, is a political analyst, author, and co-host of the Altamar podcast. Uh, previously, he was the um, Senior Vice President for Strategic Initiatives and the Founding Director of the Adrian Arsh Latin America Center at the Atlantic Council. Um, he has more than 20 years of experience in politics and media and has served as uh, the lead consultant on a number of elections worldwide, including across Latin America. I believe he's the only goat farmer we have on the Council's uh, platform this fall. <laughs> Uh, the fall's not over yet. Um, uh, Joel Velasco, next to uh, Juliana, is a principal at the Albright Stonebridge Group, uh, where he works with clients in the Latin American markets. Uh, previously, Joel was a senior executive at a California biotech firm with operations in Brazil. He's also represented the Brazilian biofuels industry, and he helped to start the Latin, Latin America practice at ASG. Um, he's also served as a senior advisor to the U.S. Ambassador to Brazil. And moderating uh, tonight's conversation is Juliana. She directs the Council's work on global cities and immigration. And in this role, she manages the Council's publications, research, and partnerships on issues relating to global cities, urbanization, global Chicago, and migration. So with that, please join me in welcoming our panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Thank you to our panel and to all of you for being here with us tonight. Um, kudos to our team who put this on the calendar. I know they reached out over the summer. They're like, there's a lot of elections happening this year, June, July, and of course, October just recently with Brazil's elections. So they had a lot of foresight on the timeliness of this conversation. Um, when I look back 10 years ago, we were looking at the region, we were looking at Latin America, there was a lot of promise in the region. We were reading headlines about Brazil's rise on the global stage. We were looking at Colombia as the, the failed state nation transformed, you know, the powerhouse now in Latin America, um, Mexico's rising, and they were all kind of really positive headlines. And today, uh, we're looking at fake news on social media, increased crime and violence, a huge crisis in Venezuela, and lots of stories focused on this populism making a comeback in Latin America. So we put together this conversation to really cover uh, a range of issues that's going on in the region. We wanted to talk about the conditions that led to the situation that we're facing in the region. We want to talk about the parallels, populism in Latin America and then the rise of populism in other parts of the world. What are the implications for these new political leaders, both in relationship to the United States, but also foreign policy more broadly and within the countries in Latin America themselves? And then what can we expect to see in the future, both on issues of migration, crime, but also on foreign policy more broadly? So with that, we're gonna kick off our conversation. Thought we'd start with Joel because Brazil's elections are really kind of top of mind and everybody has been following uh, this vote for Bolsa, Bolsonaro and the victory that he had. 55% of the vote, which was really kind of surprising. Uh, here's a candidate who derided race, gender, immigrants, the LGBTQ community, and he's the first right-wing president for more than 30 years in Brazil. So what happened, what were the conditions, and if you can really kind of look back and set the stage for our audience on what led to this moment. 
the Thank place. You. Great to great to be here. Um, let's just jump right in. Basically, if you could put it on a headline, um, what you have in Brazil, and I think in a lot of the region, is government didn't deliver. Uh, democracy, in large part, for a lot of the population in Brazil, hasn't delivered in their needs. I think both in terms of the economy, obviously Brazil uh, has, you know, they survived through the 2008 financial crisis quite well with a lot of stimulus, but then in the early 2010s, that began to uh, fall apart, and the economy has really been in a recession ever since. So the economy has really, you know, you've seen 14 million people unemployed in the country, you know, massive amounts of, of uh, businesses closing and, and those kinds of social, you know, economic issues. The government also didn't deliver when it came to uh, really security. Uh, the issue of, you know, in a country where, uh, I was thinking the other day, you got 65,000 people die every year in, in homicides. Uh, you know, I know this is an issue that comes up in this city a lot, but when you think about this, I mean, it's basically in 10 years, the entire population of DC ceases to exist, if you think of it, and that, those kinds of things. And so there's a fear of uh, among the population. And then finally, I think uh, the issue of corruption, which really kind of connected all of these, that, sh that, that people got really perceived that there is a, a government that's not only not delivering for them, but taken from them. Uh, ironically, the solution or, or the candidate that emerged out of that was somebody who <laughs> spent uh, 28 years, I believe, in Congress and uh, was previous to that a, a uh, army captain, in, in, but presented himself as an outsider, somebody who never had uh, uh, been in politics and it stuck. You know, we talk about messaging. The guy found a message and, it, and he's uh, in, in Jair Bolsonaro and he's delivering on it, at least uh, up to now. I think. It certainly is cause to pause. I'm also one of these who doesn't want to sort of paint with broad strokes and suggest that what we're seeing in Brazil is, uh, uh, you know, I think it has a lot more to do with what's going on in Brazil than necessarily what's outside of Brazil. Yeah, that reaction to the unmet promises, right, and the outside uh, politicians coming in and making promises to solve the problems. Um, it will, we'll turn back to the corruption, and especially on the, the scandals with the Operation Car Wash. I think we want to get into that a little bit more, but let's get through and make sure um, we just bring in Peter into this conversation with your thoughts on whether or not this political center is lost in Latin American politics, and why wasn't Haddad or any other maybe fiscally conservative but socially liberal candidate able to mo mobilize people in Brazil, or you know, what's the trend? Do you see this as a bigger trend in Latin America? Yeah. First, a, a big word of thanks to, to all of you for having us and for doing this panel. I think it's, it's great because this was a hugely important election and uh, with hugely important consequences. I, I wanted to just follow up on one thing that, that Joel said. I, th I think there's lots to be worried about with Bolsonaro, beginning with uh, you know, the, the potential for huge repression on crime that, that becomes a massive human rights problem. There's uh, this, this proposal that he has to liberalize gun ownership all over Brazil, which is just mind-boggling in a country that, that uh, has uh, 65,000 homicides. There's uh, the problem with minority groups. There's, there's that, that he's offended, but now he's actually thinking of legislation uh, to, to, to restrict uh, uh, some of these minority groups. Uh, there's the, his, his threats to clamp down free press. There's uh, his, the environmental problem that, that he poses by threatening to allow further agricultural development of the Amazon. And so I fear a lot of these things, and I fear the divisiveness and the destructive policies. But I fear just as much the potential that, uh, that this government ends up being a government of no accomplishments and just simply an inability to implement reforms. I think there's so many impediments in Brazil, beginning with the relationship that governors have to, okay. The, big, the relationship that governors have to um, uh, the state, they control all the police, so it's not a given that all the governors are gonna agree to this. Uh, the issue of Congress, Brazil is a, is a presidential system really in name only. It's, it's, not, it's a parliamentary system that requires huge coalitions, and therefore there's all types of 
problems of trying to sell difficult problematic reforms to Congress. And then Bolsonaro's closest group, they're constantly fighting with each other. There are people who want deep reforms uh, and industrialists who want a lot of protection. There's uh, evangelists who want to attack every communist country and agricultural uh, interests that want to sell to every communist country. I mean, there's so many incredible tensions in that coalition. So yes, I, I think, Juliana, Brazil has gone populist, but I think there's an open question as to whether the rest of the Latin America has become populist. If you look at all of Brazil's neighbors, in Argentina, Chile, and Colombia, there's a bankers and businessmen in charge of the countries. In Peru, there is a centrist, center-right president. In Costa Rica, the guy who was elected says he's center-left, but he used to represent um, either Colgate Palmolive or one of the large US, uh, US companies in, uh, in, in Costa Rica. So I, I'm not so sure, and, and, and now we get to the big question as to whether Mexico has become a, uh, is being led by a populist, which Roberta is going to take on. But I'm not so sure that Latin America has succumbed to a populist wave. Maybe because populism was invented in Latin America <laughs> and it's become immune to this, and so it exported it and lets everybody else become populist. And uh, well, it, it it resists it now. Yeah, I mean, the headlines, really, Washington Post, New York Times, The Guardian, across, you know, is all about the populism in Latin America. And it's both um, left wing, right wing, it's, it's kind of all over. And it makes you wonder, what is the narrative? What is that narrative? Is it just anti-establishment, anti-elitist? Uh, what, you know, what is playing out to, to lead to these concerns? And I think in the Mexico case, that's where the left wing candidate was uh, elected, uh, historic elections for Mexico. And, you know, but here's a candidate who has been running for a long time. He was a former mayor of Mexico City, a popular mayor from what I've read. Um, you can tell more. But when you look at Mexico's experience with their elections and the promises that he's made and the issues he's planning to confront, um, what were you seeing or what do you think of how Mexico fits into this story? Yeah, and I think, uh, thank you, Juliana. And I think it, it, you know, Mexico fits in well in many ways and, and its election was before Brazil's. But I think unconnected in some respects. In others, there are trends that we see throughout the hemisphere. First of all, I just want to say that given what we're talking about tonight, um, we all believe elections have consequences. So if you haven't voted already, <laughs> if you haven't voted already, and I, um, I hope everyone will vote, regardless of who you vote for, everyone will get out and vote. At least twice. Um, yeah, that's OK. But I'm just making a pitch for voting. Um, <laughs> What I think is really interesting about, about Mexico and, and López Obrador is some of the, some of the tendencies are very similar. Um, you obviously had a, a, a candidate winning by 53% in a four-way race, three, three candidates who actually garnered significant amounts of votes. But to, to get over 50% in a race that had, including an independent, where most people thought in Mexico you might actually win with a 30% um, uh, margin or 30% of the vote, I think is quite extraordinary. He has, he truly has a mandate. He has both houses of Congress and he has a mandate. Um, the problem in a sense, and this is what we're seeing lots of places is, he is anti-institutionalist. That, that's really what it is. The, the populism that I see of, of Lopez Obrador or AMLO in Mexico is, is an anti-institutionalist populism that the levers of power, whether it's what he calls the mafia of power in the economic business class or those who were in government, and the corruption was, was fairly overwhelming during this past government without any of the catharsis of the prosecutions and trials that you had in Brazil. Um, and, so, and so there's a lot of sort of I alone can fix this mm -hmm. language, and, that, and that's what worries me. I tend to think at this point that the labels of left and right are actually not particularly useful, either in Mexico or in Brazil right now. Um, because on one issue, these very same leaders may sound leftist, and on another, quite right wing. Um, what they are is, in some, many cases, anti-elite and playing for the crowd, playing for um, people who have, in fact, been disappointed. In Mexico, the big issue was corruption, um, and yet Lopez Obrador is elected without 
any specifics whatsoever of what he's going to do on corruption. Um, the second most important issue was security for people. And he's elected with no platform, no security plan. His, his um, tagline is that we're going to use hugs, not bullets, right? Um, abrazos, no balazos. And, and so, it, you know, there, everyone is voting for a different thing in this person that they've idealized at this point. But largely what they're rejecting is the status quo, right? Anybody but these guys. Um, and in Mexico, that was a rejection of the PRI and the PAN, the, the traditional parties. Um, and there are enormous expectations, I think, that will be difficult for almost any president to meet, regardless of what they confront in the, in the economic sphere. I was just going to jump in here on two things, because we first uh, actually would argue or point to the data that show that Bolsonaro, he won 55% of the vote in the second round. That's actually not good for Brazilian standards. This is the second round election. He should have done far better than that. And I, a lot of people expected him to go, surpass the 60%. In fact, if you look at second round results, the only two other people who have done worse than he did were Collor, impeached, Juma's second term, impeached. And uh, the other thing is, is Bolsonaro's rejection rate is extremely high. We're talking about somebody who basically half of the country uh, does, is against him. So it's a very divided country. We haven't touched on that. Normally, populists tend to give everything for everybody. We have here a much more a, a different scenario. The other thing, and I think it's an important distinction with Mexico, is we have, even though arguably Bolsonaro has been in government for many years, he has no record whatsoever. I mean, in fact, this is probably why he's done some, so well. He, he, nobody knows what he, you know, if you look at his voting record, he voted completely different than what he is espousing to now. And I think the danger is, how is this guy going to govern who's never had an executive position and how is he going to govern when he's, you, it's unclear if his ideas will stick, you know? And I think there, there, there's some similarity. Lopez Obrador obviously had uh, five years as mayor. He stepped down when he ran for the presidency the first time and came within 0.58% of, of taking the presidency in 2006. But people who point to that, you know, he left office, um, you know, 12 years ago or more. And... And since then, hasn't managed anything. Doesn't have a doesn't even have a voting record, right? He's just <laughs> campaigned. And remarkably, these two virtually career politicians mm -hmm. have run as outsiders, right? As people who are outside the system. Um, and so I think there's a similarity in the which in in Mexico, it's which AMLO is gonna is going to govern, right? Because they're not sure the more radical one or the more conventional one, more moderate one. And in Brazil, I think it's who knows how he's going to govern? And Peter, when you, I know you want to um, chime in, but it, can you also maybe address this divide, this huge divide in these countries, and what would it look like to be able to unify it if they're going to have a populist agenda that, that represents all the people? So, um. oh well, I think I think the one thing that we've seen is that populists thrive on division. And I mean, if you look everywhere in Europe where there really is a populist wave, and if you look in the United States, I mean, the key, there's two things that populism, the, the, the version that we're seeing today of populism is it needs, to ha it needs to foment severe divisions in society. And one of the ways it foments severe divisions in society is by attacking immigration and anything that's them and not us. And so whether that is people of different religions or races, et cetera, there is, there is, that, that, is that, that touch of xenophobia and everything. And I think that what, one thing that's interesting is that in Latin America so far, that has not appeared. And it has not appeared in either the centrist governments that I mentioned before. It has not appeared in, with, uh, with AMLO in Mexico. Bolsonaro is the first one who really is out there to foment division. Because if you look around Latin America, I mean, it, one country in the last two years has coughed out 2.2 million people, Venezuela, 2.2 million people. So Syria, caught, Syria exiled 6 million in six years. Venezuela is right on track. Mm 
And so, you know, 2.2 million people have been absorbed by the rest of Latin America, most of them in Colombia, but in Peru, Chile, other countries, Brazil has taken in, provided these people work permits, provided them help with housing. I mean, it had, there has been an incredibly generous and welcoming, and, and it's very difficult that this lasts because there's obviously huge economic dislocations that come with this. And already in Brazil, you begin to see at the border, because Brazil is culturally different, these mm -hmm. different languages. So you already begin to see at the border some difficulties. There was a new, fascinating New York Times article that just the other day about the resurgence of measles in Brazil, which has been practically eradicated and now is coming back because there's no health system in Venezuela. And it's coming back because of the refugees. So there is a, there is a but I, I have to say I hold hope in of the way, the way Latin American governments and citizens have behaved. I hold out a lot of hope about uh, about finding a center, about finding a, a, a discussion which is more reasonable. I'm not sure yet about Bolsonaro. The, yeah. the one thing I would say, oh. the last thing I, I want to say is I want to comment on, on what Roberta just said. It's a question whether which AMLO will, will govern. Uh, I'm sure you, you all read that last week AMLO designed this mom and pop <laughs> referendum. Um, <laughs> And he then declared Mexico's largest infrastructure project um, uh, to be null and void. It's the new airport in Mexico. It's thirty billion dollar, thirty or maybe, maybe I'm not sure about the number. Oh, a many billion dollar project, and he just declared it null and void. And so uh, Fitch uh, has now downgraded Mexico's uh, rating. Uh, its currency plummeted. Its stock market plummeted. So it, these things have huge consequences. And it, it was amazing to me that AMLO, before yet being president, he's not yet president, already is governing in one certain way. Which is why he can't actually cancel the airport, because he's not president yet. <laughs> so it'll be interesting to see whether that actually causes him to Yeah, But it has a raised a lot of concerns Absolutely. about the impulsive nature of his well, ability that, to. That's the question. Yeah. Is that going to be the way he governs? Because right after the election, and I think this, this is important. Right after the election, the signals to the market were extremely positive. And therefore, you did not see the peso drop, although people had expected it to. Um, and of course, we had the f completion of the negotiations on, on NAFTA, um, which included his negotiator, which was very unusual, um, so that he was involved in it and took it as a victory. And then he turns around and does this, and, and I think, you know, that's really the question. And I hear in López Obrador, I don't know about Bolsonaro, um, the same kind of overt rejection on occasion of representative democracy and, and an appeal to direct democracy that, frankly, we heard from Chavez early in his tenure. Yeah. And he moved increasingly to away from the National Assembly and other structures that were representative and direct to the people. Now, I do not necessarily believe that, that AMLO is Chavez. I really don't. Um, but it worries me when you, when you have that debate between representative and direct democracy and leaders start you know, veering towards, I'm going to take X item direct to the people. Um, that's mob, mob rule in the end. And this particular decision against the airport, I think, was a terrible decision. I think Amo is being told by many of his own advisors it was it was terribly run and implemented, and there's a real. But he's saying all well, the contracts are going to be respected. Um, so I guess that means he's going to pay billions of dollars for people not to build in the original airport well, and to build somewhere money, else. Right? Right. There's going to be a lot of reforms. In that and case. that's the other question <laughs> that people keep asking is where is the money coming from? I think that the question of social programs and addressing those in Mexico who've been left behind by globalization, especially in Mexico South, is incredibly important. It's long overdue. Um, the question is, where's that money going to come from? Um, this question of follow the money, if you take the example of Brazil, I mean, you know, and to Peter's point, we don't know what Bolsonaro is going to be. And that's honest truth. I don't think anybody really knows. Uh, and I think Bolsonaro has a sense of what he wants to do. but. Uh, he's going to have to build a very broad coalition. He said he's not going to do the old patronage game. I'm not sure how he's going to manage to work Brasilia without that, but let's just put that aside. He needs 
to address, he needs a major pension reform in probably in the first six months of his government. Otherwise, the country is just out of money. Uh, about, you know, they're, they're on a trajectory to just basically have to say, okay, we're not gonna pay uh, anything other than the pensions we still owe. Uh, and I think that is what really will determine his success or not. And that's usually, you know, it's the economy stupid uh, uh, angle here. But in this case, that's what actually gonna, could bring him down. Of course, he's smart enough. If he's smart enough, he puts, he's got a Chicago uh, boy as, as yeah, his. Can you uh, talk about Paulo Guedes and Paulo, kind of his Paulo, background? Yeah, Paulo Guedes is a well known economist in Brazil, uh, trained here uh, in Chicago. Um, and very much historically, uh, sort of two things that people will say about him: uh, um, you know, traditional laissez-faire, you know, the market, government. Let's get rid of as much as possible uh, on that front. And then, and then the other one is uh, he's very. He's never worked in Brasilia. He's, this is a guy who has never really, you know, he's has great ideas, but now he's going to be in charge of not just one, but really four ministries uh, in Brazil, uh, and he's he's going to have to do a lot. He has certainly the the, the brain power, and uh, he's got some some good informal advisors, and I think you know the market wants him to succeed. So to the extent that he, you know, I don't think he's going to be doing crazy things like you know canceling airport concessions. But uh, I see Peter's. No, no, I, think, I, think, I think it's really interesting. That everybody needs to watch this guy, Paolo Guedes. He's going to be the key of either success or failure because, you know, he, he's fighting against so much pressure against him because he's a big Chicago boy. So he wants to rid the Brazilian state of a lot of these very heavy and not very efficient state-owned companies. And you know, there's lots of there's lots of people who oppose them. People who want protections, the military who are so close to Bolsonaro. Uh, that pension system that Joel just mentioned, well, over a third of the pension receivers are retired military, their wives and their and their sons and daughters. Well, actually, just the daughters. Just the daughters. <laughs> just the, so just, it, it only know. follows to the women. So <laughs> you know, this is an amazing. You know, this is something that Gedges is going to go after. The other thing I think it's worth talking about Bolsonaro. He scored an enormous point last week when he managed to convince um, Sergio Moro, the mythological figure <laughs> who is. Uh, uh, Brazil's crusading anti-corruption judge. Uh, if you see a former president, a number of ministers, heads of companies in Brazilian jails today, it's because of Sergio Moro. They, they, I, I remember a year ago or two, a year, a year and a half ago, I landed in Mexico City and I took a taxi from the airport and I said, how are things? And as usual, the taxi drivers anywhere in the world, things are horrible, things are terrible, it's corrupt here. And then, you know, I let him go on and on and said, so what, so what, what are you going to do in here in Mexico? And the answer was, we need Brazilian judges, mm -hmm. not, not American judges. We need Brazilian judges because they're, they're the guys who put people into jail. And so now Bolsonaro scored a real coup, and Sergio Moro has agreed to be part of Bolsonaro's government. This is a really important step. So now he has two huge figures, Paulo Guedes and, and uh, Sergio Moro, as part of his government. This is, he's, he's, had, a, he's had a good week, Bolsonaro. Yeah. Well, week. and on Sergio Moro, for those of you who don't know, there was this Operation Car Wash, which was one of the largest scandals, I think, in the world, from what I had read, um, where all politicians and business executives had been involved in. And he tackled that investigation, and then most recently was responsible for Lula also being in prison. So um, really high profile cases, and now he'll be heading up the judiciary. Um, on the corruption issue, which is something that all these candidates keep running on, and they say that they're going to solve the corruption problems, you, you mentioned, um, Ambassador Jacobson, that uh, Lopez Obrador didn't actually have an agenda for, for tackling it. Um, what are kind of the big cases in Mexico that he would need to, like, is it, is it on the narcotics, is it on um, trafficking, or is there just more corruption in the government with you know, overpaid salaries and pensions and benefits no, for I the think, employees? I, I think in Mexico, you have a number of things. First of all, you've got either 19 or 20 governors, former governors, who are either indicted in prison, have fled the country, pending extradition, or, um, or already convicted. So 
there's the the sort of um, emblematic gubernatorial cases of, of corruption, some quite extreme, um, that he can pursue. But, but he has a perfect opportunity. In 2016, Mexico passed six or seven laws that together form their national anti-corruption system. And it was, it's only half implemented. It was never fully implemented by the current government. So the easy thing to do, and I believe the right thing to do, would have been to say, during your campaign or subsequently, I'm going to fully implement the national anti-corruption system, including an independent AG who is approved by the Congress or named by the Congress from a list that the president gives, and, and whose term outlives the six-year term of the presidency so that it doesn't have to always be such a political position. And I'm going to name the anti-corruption prosecutor that's in that, that, those statutes. And he's not said that. He, in fact, seems to have some ambivalence about the idea of an independent attorney general. Mexico also began uh, judicial reform about eight years ago to transition from a, a Spanish inquisitorial system, uh, just to judge everything in writing, to an oral adversarial system in which, although there are huge flaws in it that have to be fixed, conviction rates have, in the states that have fully implemented it, gone from about 2 to 3 percent to over 30 percent. Nowhere near what a US prosecutor would consider acceptable, but certainly better than, than it was. Um, that's got to be fully implemented, and he hasn't really talked about that. So I think there are lots of areas that he could make progress in anti-corruption. So far, all you hear is, well, he's not corrupt. He says, I am not corrupt. My ministers will not be corrupt, and therefore it will all sort of follow. Um, the fact is, I don't believe him to be personally corrupt. I'm not entirely convinced of all the ministers, but, but it's, it, setting the moral example is not going to be enough in a system that entrenched. Um, and so there are a lot of things that need to be done. The question is, you know, he has majorities in Congress. He has a, a real mandate. I think, as Joel says, 55% in a two-person race is very different than 53% yeah, in a four-person race. He really did mm -hmm. do extraordinarily well. But you don't see him necessarily taking the bull by the horns, even though this is an enormously long transition in Mexico. It's five months. Um, I hope he will, because I think people really are demanding that greater transparency in their government. And, and what worries me most of all in all of these countries, including our own, is the sense that if democracy continues not to deliver, that democracy itself is beginning to be rejected. The numbers of people who don't believe democracy is the best system in the world or the right one for their country uh, is increasing, um, somewhat dramatically among young people. And, and that is extremely worrisome. Yeah. Well, Bolsonaro ran with this kind of return of the military campaign also in Brazil, militarization on, on crime in particular in the cities. And when we look at the statistics of the homicide rates of the cities that are the most violent, um, of the 42 out of 50 most violent cities, like 17 of them are in Brazil alone. Um, 42 in total are in Latin America. Mexico has uh, like another 12 of the most violent cities. And thinking about how they're going to be able to tackle this huge problem that the people on the ground are feeling and they want their government to solve, but if they're going to come in with their harsh tactics, I mean, when we look at Brazil, I don't know, Joel, if you have any ideas of what his plan is going to be, but it's already a militarized zone in Rio and some of these places, um, and it hasn't been well received. So, Rick, I mean, I think first he he chose the he he he's obviously comes from the military and he's embraced uh, military sort of doctrine and 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 really. Uh, use that language a lot, largely also because uh, it's really the only remaining institution in Brazil that is respected uh, and is perceived as beyond corruption. Even the judges, to some extent, uh, uh, in Brazil, I think the Brazilians of the last few years know their judges better than they know their own soccer team players, is, is, is it's true. Uh, and, but that's because so much has come down to course. But he chose the military, and he's, he comes from it because I think it, it, is, it resembles sort of, okay, these guys are the law and order. There's a little bit of a feeling of nostalgia for, hey, you know, Brazil had economic miracle in the 70s, and by the way, we didn't have all these murders and, and so forth, so it must be because the military was a solution. My view is 
I think the military in Brazil, the last thing they want is to take on this assignment. Uh, this is not an assignment that they, they know they can succeed in. What's going to really require in Brazil, I think, is a much longer term. I mean, the reason there's so much uh, 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 violence, for instance, in Rio, really comes down to it's become a failed state. Uh, and what worries me is that Bolsonaro is going to empower uh, militias you know, this is where I think the, the comparison to Venezuela is scary because he, here's, is that he will sort of say, well, listen, we don't have the resources, but it's okay. You guys start protecting your neighborhood. And by the way, that will be also, that's going to become a highly corrupt process. But it is that, that scares me. And that's where the violence and things can get out of hand. And I think this is what, you know, worries a lot of people, including myself. Yeah, can you talk about how it works with the cities too from the national level? Sure, yep, sorry. Brazil is today a war zone. I mean, 60, I mean, I, I want to repeat Joel's figure, 65,000 homicides a year. This is a war zone today. So if you ask me, choose one issue, explain to me why, give me one reason for Bolsonaro's election, and I'll say crime. Mm -hmm. Overwhelmingly, the reason this man got elected is because Brazilians want something done on crime. They want a law and order president. And so the most popular thing that Bolsonaro is going to do is he's going to militarize the poor neighborhoods all over Brazil. This is going to be initially, initially a huge success because he's going to go in and just like it was in Rio 10 years ago, it's going to look like a show of force of the state and it's going to, it's going to be tough and it's going to be, they're going to clamp down. But then there's going to be increasing amounts of human rights abuses, of arrests, of killings, of, of people's kids getting, getting, uh, getting hit in the crossfire. And this, is, this, this has all the potential to go wrong relatively fast, particularly because the implementation of this is going to be very scattershot, because governors in Brazil are in charge of, the poli of, of two police forces, the civil police forces and militarized police forces. These are governors who are in charge. So to get cooperation from a governor, Bolsonaro needs, needs a governor to say, I want to, I want to, I want to work with you. Some governors will enthusiastically. Some governors won't, because they're not from Bolsonaro's party, because they oppose Bolsonaro, et cetera. And other governors, the ones who do say they will, some of them may want to show that they're even more Bolsonaro than Bolsonaro and really come down strong. So I, I think that the, on the one hand, this has all the, all the potential to go wrong. And on the other hand, the implementation of this is going to be very scattered and different throughout the country. Yeah, I'll just say one thing. Um, when it comes to you know, the way uh, police works in Brazil correctly. Govern the governors are in charge of security within their state. What's sad is, or what's problematic is, they don't have resources because the power it attacks, all the money flows through the central government. Uh, and then to the units of federa the federation, states, and municipality. Same. Same. So that means the president has, you know, the money, and he will say, well, do you want me, you want uh, to deal with your state, you need to do this or that other thing. So it becomes all politicized, part of the reason why we are in the situation we are. Uh, I think what, what I also want to make sure is we don't get confused here uh, is that the role of the military as sort of the, the idea that they can solve everything. That's one. Um, and I think, unfortunately, Brazil has some sort of historical examples of things got better, you know, from a, from a state, from a security standpoint. Um, the other one is to remember that the, the police institutions, you know, uh, uh, Peter alluded to uh, the military police in Brazil. The military police is not the military police as we think here. It just happens to be called military. It is just the way they're organized. And those are the people who Bolsonaro have basically said, a good criminal is a dead criminal. And if you shoot, we won't ask questions. And I think it is how quickly that can spin out of control. And then we're in a situation where security hasn't gotten better, but the state, the government, has even less say in security. Yeah, one of the things I was going to mention in terms of Mexico is obviously the the second most important, and it, it kept changing, um, feature for Mexican voters was often security. Um, and there were somewhere between 29 and 31,000 homicides 
last year, that many of which were drug related, I, I would remind people that there were over 70,000 US overdoses last year, um, of which 40,000 plus were probably fentanyl, um, the synthetic um, opioid heroin. Um, and so, you know, Mexicans and, and Americans at this point have this useless battle occasionally about who's paying more, who, who is, who's feeling the, these drug wars worse, right? Uh, the fact is people are dying in enormous numbers on both sides of the border, and the only way to resolve that is, is together, right? Is working on the demand side as well as the supply side and transit side. But, but what's happened in Mexico is a breakdown of larger cartels, uh, which had a certain amount of discipline into small and fragmented cartels, and removing the heads of those cartels, those who were in charge, who often imposed the discipline, now you have less of that, and you have them vying 20 or 25 cartels, vying for, for roots and for the money, and therefore the violence has increased. But, but we also see the impact of all of this ourselves in the US, um, and therefore, it, it is and must be the security situation um, a really prominent part of the bilateral relationship. And right now, I don't, I don't think either side has a strategy. Right. There are talking points and there are allegations against each other, but not really a strategy. Um, and migration is a completely separate issue. But interestingly, the one thing I would say is that you know, obviously we've looked at northward migration vis-a-vis -vis Central America or Mexico into the United States for quite a while. We now have the countries of South America um, looking at a, a really grave humanitarian crisis uh, of refugees and migrants out of Venezuela, larger than we've ever seen in the region. So the whole issue of migration and refugees is becoming one that is a regional issue um, at precisely the time the Trump administration has walked out of the global um, compact on migration and is removing itself from the international structures that might help resolve some of those crises. Yeah, I mean, he just announced that he's sending troops down to the U.S.-Mexico border because of the migrant caravan that's coming up from Central America. And um, a lot have been dwindling throughout Mexico, and so Mexico has been also addressing their own challenges with integration and figuring out yeah. um, there isn't a shared answer. But but the one the one... The one constant between the Venezuelan migration crisis and the Central American migration northward, which I don't actually think is a crisis as it reaches this border, but, but it is an issue, is that unless you address the root causes of those migration, whether it's a failed economic model and authoritarian government and corrupt government in Venezuela, or the poverty and lawlessness that's driving Central American migrants, you will continue to have people coming out of both places. Peter, can we just bring in Colombia really quickly? I don't, before we turn to the Q&A, um, I want to make sure that we talk about some other countries. And you just brought up um, narcotics. And I, when I look at the Colombian elections in June and who won there, um, also being labeled as a populist, more on the right side. I know you probably have different reactions. But um, the question with him, which was interesting, is that he was kind of an anti-FARC negotiation and peace agreement candidate, uh, even though Juan Manuel Santos worked really hard for that agreement of ending a 50-year conflict uh, with in Colombia. So uh, what were your impressions on how Colombia fits into this general conversation in the region? Well, just a few words on Colombia, and then I'll talk about how it fits in. I mean, I think that Colombia is, continues to be one of the great success stories of the world. Um, a country that was 25 years ago was on the brink of absolute failure is today a thriving, increasingly middle-class country, full of problems, but a, a, a country that works and that has, notwithstanding all types of um, uh, tough rhetoric on the pres in, the pre in the recent presidential campaign, has elected a man who is from the center-right and who is governing in a highly responsible manner today. And so, um, you know, th the country, among its most recent achievements has been, as Juliana said, uh, signing a peace agreement, ending the, the longest uh, civil conflict in Latin America, um, for which the former president got the Nobel Peace Prize, and, and um, 
and that has made a lot of difference, but it has also created a lot of resentment in Colombia because part of that piece has been to give away some, some things to the FARC that people uh, have found uh, that, they, that Santos went too far. In principally, it is it, the two things that people resent are the fact that they are the FARC will not be, if, if they confess, they will not be tried in regular courts, but in special courts, and they will serve, uh, they will serve sentences uh, as a social penalty. So serving sentences often in the areas where they committed abuses. And the second thing that people resent is that as part of the agreement, the FARC actually has five seats in Congress um, that are non-elected, they just have them for the next five years. So th that, that has created a Colombia that's divided on the peace, but I think Duque has been very smart that he campaigned on, I'm against the peace, but he hasn't governed that way at all. Um, and meanwhile, every day, 70,000 people cross the border from Venezuela. 70,000 people. Now, many of those go right back. They do shopping and they go back. But this is a huge, huge, because there's nothing, there's nothing in Venezuela. There's n nothing in the pharmacies. There's nothing in the food stores. And so people come, people who live along the border are actually quite fortunate. So they, come, they cross the border in order to shop. But the, the Colombia has taken in 1.2 million refugees who live in Colombia today and has so far been very, very hospitable and very generous with the way they have treated those refugees. But there's no doubt that the, Venezuela is creating a regional crisis because uh, how long can that last? That refugees well, what are the chances pouring? these countries are going to, you know, organize against that? What, well, what is that? What are we going to see in Venezuela? I think, I think, you know, uh, Roberta should probably talk a little bit here from the U.S. standpoint, at least to try to understand how they'll see this. But for the last several years, uh, the U.S. government has been trying to get the Brazilians to step up and be more active in terms of combating uh, uh, the government of Venezuela's uh, actions, but also taking in refugees. Um, they got their wish. They, they got their wish. And uh, I think he's certainly going to combat Maduro's government. I'm not sure about taking in refugees. I think the, the challenge on the Brazilian side, it's, if it weren't for television, nobody in Brazil would know about what's happening in, in the country, in, in Venezuela on the border, because it is so far remote, removed from it. It is so far out. And you've got this beautiful Amazon forest in between uh, the population centers and the border. So I think there will be a desire to work together. I think the danger is what is the U.S. going to ask and what is, are these countries going to actually be able to deliver? I, I, I think that is, to me, you know, Bolsonaro is going to come to the U.S. probably pretty soon. He'll say all the nice things to President Trump. President Trump's probably going to give him a nice pat on the back. And presumably, the governments are going to actually try to work on something. And what that something is, to me, is unclear. Yeah. We need to take questions from the audience. We are quickly running out of time. Um, I know we could sit up here for hours talking about Latin America. So um, now we have our lights on. Please raise your hands. Um, let's start with uh, Simi back there, please. Thank you. Uh, thanks for this conversation. I think it's uh, particularly crucial considering that, you know, given the current uh, issue of migration and it's we're living in a time where there's 68 million displaced people across the, the planet, that this is certainly an issue that is very pressing. So I actually have two questions. I'm just pulling up my notes here. Uh, the panelists- You get were, one, Simi, you get one. Okay, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring it down to one. So as someone who holds both dual citizenship between the United States and Venezuela, I'm, I'm very keen on hearing what exactly as what exactly is required of governments, of municipalities, when we are labeling certain subject matters or certain issues a crisis, quote unquote, and in some cases a war zone, quote unquote, right? Because we have a precedent where we have labeled certain issues a genocide, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there's action that's taken. So I'm very curious to learn from the panelists whether labeling the, the issues that are ensuing as a war zone or as a crisis, and in some cases not a crisis, does that then deem 
government officials responsible for doing something or the local population for doing something. Okay, thank you. Um, Ambassador Jacobson, do you want to take that? Sure. <laughs> um, although many people who are not in government have pronounced on this, I think, you know, one of the things I think that, I, I do think words matter, and I think that when you use the word crisis, or you overuse the word crisis, it loses some of its accuracy. There are tools that are available in crisis situations that are not, in things not called crises. Um, and I think that when you call a, a migrant caravan, for example, of whether it's 7,000 or 3,500 or 1,000 by the time it gets here, a national emergency, as has been said, it devalues that, that phrase. A national emergency actually does have legal and policy implications for the United States. Um, th this isn't it. I think also it's very important in the context of Venezuela, and I think this is you know, maybe what, what Joel and, and Peter were getting at in terms of you know, as you put together coalitions, right? there is the Lima group of countries that have already sort of stood up and said that the region has to do more to find an answer to this problem, push the Venezuelans for both economic reforms and political reforms, um, which has not worked in the past because you have in Maduro a leader who seems impervious to sanction, right? He does not care how he impoverishes and, and starves his own people. Um, but you need more countries in the region to come on board in that group. That group was Fundamentally, I'm not sure whether it was missing Brazil, but it was certainly not, it didn't have Brazil as a leader, which it may have now, although uh, you know, simultaneously it will lose Mexico as a leader because mm -hmm. AMLO will no longer lead on Venezuela the way the current government did. But you must get the Caribbean countries. And they've been, even though they're small, they're, they're, they're critical for a consensus at the OAS if you're gonna try and do things and, or even in the UN, and they've been very reluctant, partly because of Petro Caribe, which at this point is, is, a, is absurd. I mean, there's, there's no reason for it. But people are, are, were afraid for a long time to, to speak out against Venezuela. Um, but I think that one of the most important things is for the US, frankly, to take the military option off the table. Because what's really worrying, I think, leaders around the hemisphere is some of the comments that have been made about possible military intervention, um, including potentially using, ha involving the US, which is really the, the part you have to distinguish. Um, and I think without being clearer about that not being an option, that you're looking at everything else and a whole bunch of things, and that includes, for example, you know, giving TPS to Venezuelans who are in the United States, temporary protected status, and not returning them. We are still deporting Venezuelans back there, um, which is absurd to me. Um, but in any case, there are a whole series of things you can do, and if you take that military option for U.S. involvement off the table, I think you could help reduce some of the concern and paranoia from certain governments in the region. Let's take another question um, before we run out of time. I know Whatever it is, it's not mine. <laughs> no, um, let's, right here, um, please. Ed, uh, Andrea, yeah. I had a question for the panel specifically about Mexico, but it applies with all the political flows in terms of corporate investment, particularly with Mexico, that under Peña Nieto, you saw so much investment in telecom, with AT&T, manufacturing, aerospace petroleum diversification. What do you think is going to happen now in terms of corporate investment given the swing under AMLO? And I guess this also goes for the swings happening in other parts of Latin America. Well, for me, I think it's pretty easy on Mexico, but I think it may be true on Brazil too. There's just a, there's a continuing holding of breath in, in, from my perspective. Um, people who are ready and willing to go to continue or go back or start working in Mexico, who were waiting for both NAFTA and the elections, who are still very unsure. And emerging markets in general, I think, are, are, are soft right now as people wait to see what happens. But I don't know, the Brazil yeah. experts. I, I, so I'll just say, in terms of Brazil, Brazil's been managing through all of this crisis as we've had, impeachments and so forth. Foreign direct investment in Brazil has remained strong. You have not seen. You've seen a little bit of a shifting, less from the U.S., more from China. But FDI has been very strong into Brazil. 
Uh, I think the question of whether it will continue uh, will largely depend on, ironically, I think the policies, not just that Bolsonaro has in terms of, 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 uh, of his fiscal and economic policies, but also I think some of the social issues he brings up. I've talked to a number of, of some of our clients and others just companies who said, listen, if this guy starts you know, going after minorities this way, we're gonna pull everybody, you know, at least from our corporate standpoint, out of that. And I think that will get their attention very quickly, uh, which I think is a, it's, a, it's a good thing. Companies are actually gonna be part of the check here. But, but I think there is something to be, to be, there's an interesting parallel to our president's inauguration. <laughs> I mean, after his election, the stock markets here roared and, and have continued to, to roar until very recently. Um, and and in, in Brazil right now, there is a Bolsonaro high, mostly having to do with Paulo Guedes and the possibility that he becomes the super finance minister that changes a lot of things. But right now, the real has risen in price, the stock market is booming, uh, and so there's a, there's a lot of positive anticipation from business about what's going to happen in Brazil. And I think after the airport in Mexico, there's a lot of worry in, uh, from particularly foreign investors. I'm going to take a question from our online platform here, um, one, and I'm going to actually modify it just a tiny bit. But the question is, would uh, AMLO been, have been elected with or without Trump? What was the impact of Trump on his election? And I'd like to think of that also in the context of Brazil or Colombia. What's been that impact of having President Trump at the helm of the United States influencing elections in Latin America? And we'll start with Mexico, if you have any impressions. But Just I know real quick, I think. Um, I think Mexicans care a lot more about the bilateral relationship and what's going on in the United States than voters perhaps elsewhere in Latin America because of the proximity. But I think it had very little to do with the election of Lopez Obrador. Um, I think, in fact, Lopez Obrador was, it was his moment. Um, he chose the subject right to focus on anti-corruption. And people were sick with the, of the other parties. So I, I think it was very limited in terms of how that, that bounce sort of on Trump helped him. Yeah, I would say, I would say the same thing. I, mean, I don't think Bolsonaro effect has to do with the issues I've talked about, security, economy, and this, this concern about corruption. Uh, it's provided a character for the, for the storyline in the press. But it really, I don't think, has anything to do with it uh, uh, in the case of Brazil either. So in my previous life, I was a political consultant, so I did polling all over the place in Latin America. And two, two things stand out. I, th I think Joel's absolutely right. I mean, there was, Trump had played no role, even though Bolsonaro seems like the tropical Trump, right? But, but, um, but, he, but Trump really played no role at all in Brazil. And in Mexico, what is amazing, I saw, I, I looked at a lot of polls in Mexico, is it's really surprising how little Trump counted in the Mexican mm -hmm. election. It's, it's amazing, mm -hmm. because it, the, the northern border was le is led by a man who repeatedly has reviled Mexico and Mexicans. And it's amazing to me that it just did, didn't play. It didn't play mm -hmm. at all. And, and, and it's also amazing that AMLO didn't make it an issue, no, which was very smart right, of him. Right. That's which was very smart of because he could have made it an issue, but he didn't make it an issue. So, but, he, but I do think it's important to note that there's been an over 35 percent drop in U.S. approval in Mexico mm -hmm. okay. uh, since President Trump came to office, because that eventually constrains politicians too. Correct. I think the place where Trump counts most is in Caracas. <laughs> So we are coming up on our time. We only have um, about two minutes left, and I really do want to let our panelists have their kind of closing comment and their closing thoughts to, to walk home with. Um, and, and if you could also just integrate into your kind of final recommendation, you know, what's the one issue that you recommend that people follow closely in Latin America over the next year or five years? You know, what's that, what's that one thing that we want to see come to fruition? And, and if you can also, in the 20 seconds that you'll have um, each, uh, talk about what that means for the United States in relationship with the U.S. So let's start with Joel. Okay. I mean, listen, I think, I think in the case of Brazil, uh, specifically, uh, watch the fiscal adjustment the country is going to go through pension reform. If they can't do that, none of this is going to really matter. Uh, I think in terms of the relationship with the U.S., it's, it, Brazil's certainly going to get much better. Uh, 
uh, in terms of, of closer ties. What is the substance, you know, inside that relationship? It's still, to me, uh, greatly uh, uh, an unknown. And I would say that that you know, I we we don't I don't want to end in a pessimistic note. I actually think that out of these changes, things some good things can come out of it. And I think uh, the U.S. Brazil relationship may improve. Uh, strangely as it may be, as well as um, uh, security and, and anti-corruption efforts in Brazil. So I don't, I wouldn't have voted for him, but I think you know we got to give him a chance now. Mm. I would simply say that to me, the things we have to watch are issues around the cluster of the rule of law, which are the most important issues I think in the region, specifically in Mexico right now, um, and efforts on, on against corruption. I don't think people will continue to support, fundamentally support democracy without those. And I think it's a shame that at this point we, we that is the United States government, um, of which I'm no longer a part, but I still use it for all of us as citizens, um, we can no longer be a leader in either of those two areas. I would say three things. In Brazil, watch the relationship between Paulo Guedes, the super finance minister, and the guy who's called the minister of the presidency. He's sort of the chief of staff, a guy called On 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 Onyx Lorenzotti, who is, uh, is he's going to be the, the guy who's going to try to sell all of these policies to Congress. If their relationship is a good one, this, uh, the Bolsonaro presidency can be successful. The second thing I would say is, we didn't talk about him at all, but President Macri in Argentina is mm -hmm. in deep trouble. Mm -hmm. And that is the place where I see a potential resurgence of populism. I'm hoping that that's not the case. I'm hoping that he is successful, but Argentina is in for a very, very severe recession in the next 12 months. And it, it's also an election is coming. And there is no doubt in my mind, the third thing, that the most important regional issue is Venezuela. If Venezuela keeps spewing out humans from that country, we are on pace to have a Syria-like consequence in, in the region. And the region cannot absorb six million people. It is just, it's, it's impossible. And so uh, that crisis, for Venezuelans, of course, for, the, for the, the, the horrible, horrible situation they face, but also for the rest of the region is really a hugely important thing. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for spending your evening with us, and thank you all for joining our program today on Latin America. Uh, just a friendly reminder that the live stream is available on our website, so if you want to go back and watch it or share it with anybody else you think would be interested in this conversation. We also hosted a podcast last week that's available on our website with Peter, where you talked uh, mostly on Brazil, but there were some other implications for the region, so I encourage you to check that out as well. Um, thank you all, and have a good evening. Thank you.